Hey, g'day, it's Preso. Welcome back to the workshop today. Now, after the success of the Titan model aircraft engine series, I thought to myself, you know what? I should milk this for all it's worth. <laughs> and to that end, I dug out this little engine that was sitting in a box of stuff. This was um, purchased by me with my own money back in 1972, so that makes it 50 years old. And it's a Taipan Tyro 1.9cc diesel engine. Now these were made in Australia by a gentleman named Gordon Burford. Uh, he operated out of South Australia. And these were regarded as being a very rugged beginner's uh, engine for model aircraft enthusiasts. They retailed for $12.99 when they were released. I think I paid about $13 or $14 for it. And uh, when I took it out of the box, it was missing propeller, it was missing the nut on the end of the crankshaft and the washer, and the needle valve. Now I was able to find a nut and washer. The needle valve came from the same gentleman that supplied me with the fuel for this engine and also the Titan engine. Now he has a collection of model engines that you would not believe and I want to be able to show you some of those in this video. We'll go and visit his workshop and have a look at some of the stuff that he's got but it's pretty impressive. Now what I'm going to do in this video is we're going to do a restoration. So I'm going to strip this engine down We'll clean all of the parts, inspect it, and then we'll reassemble it. But I'll do all of the finishing processes on this first. So we're going to make the engine look really pretty. And then we're going to run it. Now, I have a book which was loaned to me. And it has some performance data for this engine, showing you what RPM it should do with different size props. So we'll check that and see how close it is. And I'll talk about the history of Taipan engines and also the book that I was given. But right now, we're going to start dismantling this. Now, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to do it. We'll get everything clean, and then we'll start doing some of the decorative finishing processes on this. Okay, should be fun. should all come apart fairly easily because I soaked this in WD-40 for quite a while. So I'm hoping that uh, none of these fasteners around here are really, really tight. Uh, apparently this was one of the faults with this engine, that uh, the very early ones that were made, they used um, sort of like soft tapping screws and often they shear off in the aluminium casting. This is a single hole in the spray bar. See a lot of scuff marks on that back plate there. That's where the end of the crank pin's been rubbing on that. These four screws down here could be the issue. And these are actually metal threads rather than soft tappers, so that's a good sign. Okay, it's a bit tight. So it looks like the, the gudgeon pin is just a solid steel pin. 
Uh, the ends have been routed over though. And the connecting rod looks like it's just been stamped out of a bit of flat aluminium bar. So none of the side of that connecting rod have been machined. It's just got the stamp marks on it, I think. Yeah, looks like it. Pretty rough. <laughs> so the piston, the flat top, little washer just fell out of it there. I'm not sure if that's a, just a spacer. Looks like there's only one. That's interesting. So flat top piston, looks like it's cast iron. Right, now I'm not sure. I think the prop driver is splined onto the crankshaft, which might mean we need to put this in some sort of a fixture so we can knock the crank pin or the crankshaft out of there. Just had to rest the back of the crankcase on this aluminium block here. If I put it up like that, it's uh, rubbing on the back of this projection here on the top of the crankcase. So I'll rest that over the edge there. Let's see if we can punch that out. Yep, so that's been splined onto the end of the crankshaft. The, uh, the crankshaft still looks really good. It's sort of very smooth and polished where it's been running in the bushes. Looks like there's a bronze bush in this end. And yeah, that bronze bush goes all the way through. And there's the inlet port, just a plain drilled round hole. All right, so that's it. Basically, they're all the parts. So we're gonna get all of these clean now. I'll run these through the ultrasonic and then I'm gonna bead blast this part. I'll have to protect some of these surfaces here and the bronze bush. And there might be a few little nicks and cuts and scratches. There's a bit of damage around here that I'll need to file out. But then we'll bead blast all of that. Anyway, let's get all these through the cleaner now. These are all the steel parts and the iron parts, I'm guessing, for the piston. So these have had a preliminary clean. There was a very thin paper gasket around this uh, surface here, which clamps down against the top of the crankcase. That will need to be replaced. 
But what uh, the ultrasonic cleaner does really well is it removes any of that sort of caked on grease and dirt and grime. And then the next step with scrubbing with a toothbrush and some Ajax, that also helps to dislodge anything that's caught in fine threads or trapped corners and that sort of thing. So, you know, scrubbing with a toothbrush, uh, I find is a you know, quick and simple way of just getting rid of any other grime that might be caked on there. Now, a lot of the staining and discoloration on these parts is probably just a very light corrosion. And what I'll do now is I'm just gonna keep all of these parts coated with some WD-40 until it all goes back together again because I don't want these to flash rust now that they've been cleaned. So here are the alloy parts. Uh, once they come out of that uh, ultrasonic cleaner, that's removed any of the, the loose uh, surface dirt and caked on grease and grime and so on. And then you can get the rest of that in the sink with the toothbrush and the Ajax. And some of the areas like in the back of the crankcase there, we had to get in that with a, a little fine wire brush that I've got, which is really good for getting into tight corners. And this surface here where the gasket would have been, some of that area is going to be visible and I want to get that sort of uh, surface restored back to its original aluminium colour. The bead blaster might do that, uh, but I don't want to get any of the bead blasting material into this cavity in here, so I'll probably block all of that up. I can use blue tack for a lot of these um, operations to block holes. Uh, it's sort of easy to pack in there and it, and it sort of doesn't get disrupted by the bead blasting. So uh, I'm going to get these ready and also I'm going to check each casting for any damage. Now this one's got a little bit of um, like a nick in that corner there and I'm going to file that off and then when it goes into bead blasting uh, the process of bead blasting will give everything a uniform finish and it'll hide any areas that have been filed. So let's do that. That's sort of got rid of the, the most of the damage that I can see. Uh, there's some areas that you really can't fix. So where these uh, pattern of uh, marks are around these holes here, that's from where the screw heads have actually worn into the die casting. So I can't put that metal back. It's just gonna have to stay like that. So what I'll do now is I'm gonna plug these holes and then we'll get into the, the bead blaster. This is just a bamboo skewer, I'm tapering that end and I'll just use this to keep the, the beads out of that thread there. Probably won't damage the thread but we don't want to block it up with little glass beads either. So I'll get all of those done, now I'm not bothered about down in here, um, it would actually be a good thing if we can sort of blend that, get rid of all of the pretty rough machining marks actually inside that Venturi. And if we do get any beads in there, they'll come out quite easily. Oh, the rain is back, um, but interestingly the glass bead didn't stick to that blue tack. I was almost certain it would just uh, 
frost over that surface but it just bounced straight off so what we can do now is remove all of this and it comes away quite cleanly which is a good thing and on the Titan engine I actually made plastic plugs to go in all, all of these holes but uh, yeah, blue tacks a lot simpler There is a bit of glass bead inside there. That would have come in through the Venturi. But I'm gonna get this part uh, cleaned up now, get all the bits out of it, and we'll put this part aside, and we're gonna start burnishing the other aluminium parts that go on the engine. I'm gonna clean up this prop driver. Uh, this edge here is quite badly damaged. So what I've done is I've pressed it onto the crankshaft and I've put it in a split aluminium bush. And I'm going to set this up in the four jaw and dial it in. And then I can get at all of these surfaces. Some of them uh, just need polishing. Uh, but this one here is going to need some burnishing. Now that driver is pressed onto that spline very, very tightly. Uh, it took uh, quite an effort to get it on there actually. So I'm not going to bother retaining that with the screw. Uh, now, because this is sort of all nicked and damaged, uh, the only way to fix that is either to machine it off, which makes it smaller, or you can try to roll some metal back up onto this top edge here. Now what I've got here is one of these polished burnishing tools. What I'm going to try to do, it may not work, <laughs> What I'm going to try to do is to put the burnishing tool between the split bush and that edge and see if I can roll some metal up and then do the same thing this way. So I'll run the part fairly low speed and just see if that's going to work. Uh, if it doesn't, I'm just going to have to machine it off. Now that sort of seems to be working. Um, so what we're really trying to do here is to roll some metal and displace it from this end flat surface adjacent to the split bush and from this tapered surface here. We're trying to roll it uphill and you know, progressively push it to where we want it to go. And if we can get enough metal pushed over there, we can just skim it with the, the lathe tool and that might make it look right. So I'm just gonna put some oil on this and I'm gonna keep at it and see how we get on. I think we're actually getting somewhere, you know. <laughs> um, there's a really bad nick there, but the rest of it's starting to look pretty good. So the goal here is uh, so that we don't have to machine too much off. That nick there is probably like about a quarter of a millimetre deep. And essentially what we're doing here is similar to what you do when you're knurling. So knurling isn't a cutting process. Knurling is actually displacing metal and pushing it from one place to another. So if we can get enough material to sort of flow back uphill and fill in these nicks, there'll be less to do with the tool. I'll give it a bit more and then we'll start doing some polishing on this part. Okay, I reckon I've done that. It's a little bit gnarly, uh, but I think we can polish that out. But I've been able to avoid, you know, removing a lot of metal off there and, you know, dimensionally changing the shape of the part. So, um, there's a, like a bad little burr there. So I'm just going to touch that up with a, a fine file and then we'll just use some emery cloth. Uh, it's still got a little bit of damage around there. I'll 
do want to get it out. <laughs> um, I don't really want to cut it with a lathe tool. I Man, I'd have a choice here, you know. Well, unfortunately, it's not come out as good as I would have hoped for, so I'm just going to skim this. Uh, I'll take off the bare minimum, and uh, that way it's going to look the same. Uh, if you measured it, you're going to see. Okay, that's got it. Oh, that's what it looks like finished. Pretty happy with that. This part is pretty badly damaged on this edge here. And once again, I don't really want to machine it, but I may have to. Again, just want to take off the bare minimum. Okay, I think that part's done. So what I did there was just lightly machine this on all of these exposed surfaces because none of those dimensions there are critical and the oxide that was built up on those surfaces was really hard to remove with abrasives. So I just skimmed it all over. I sanded inside with some uh, 400 wet and dry and then I finished up with one of these little uh, Kratex points. Now, these are quite rigid and uh, tough and they abrade those surfaces quite easily. So uh, that allowed me to get right across the face of that recess and along the, the inside as well. Now it's time to make the spinner. Now this is a piece of aluminium stock that I've turned. It's the correct diameter and the correct length for the profile of the spinner that I've chosen. And the back of it's threaded 316th BSF and this is the stud from the original Taipan engine. So it's just held in a ER32 collet and we can wind the stock onto that to hold it while we do this process. And this will help to ensure that the spinner runs absolutely true when it's on the engine because we've preloaded the thread against the back of that collet there. This is my Tornado freehand turning attachment. Now, I bought this some time ago and I used this same tool to make the spinner for the Titan engine. And it worked so well, I thought I'd try it out here. Now the important thing here is that you need to have a template. The template that I've got is cut from three millimeter thick acrylic. I did that in my CO2 laser. The profile, this bit here, this is the bit we're interested in. This came from a photograph I found in a, a book for the Taipan Tyro engine that had the aluminum spinner. And this little finger traces around the profile of that template and pattern and it translates whatever the finger does to the position of the high speed steel tool. So as long as you keep the stylus in contact with the template, you'll end up with the right shape. So let's get this set up and let's do it.
Okay, that's going to need a lot more polishing, but I think you get the idea. So what I'll do now is drill a cross hole in the end of this so we can tighten the spinner up onto that stud uh, when we put the propeller on the engine. Okay, that's my center, so I just used a uh, edge finder to touch off on the end of the spinner. And according to my drawing, it's 5.14 from the very end of the spinner to the center of a two millimeter hole. That center drill has a two millimeter pilot and here's a two millimeter twist drill so nothing should slide off the end of that curved profile. Okay, that bit's done. I think that's going to look a lot better than that hex nut washer, and this will get anodized later. So this is Colin, Colin Mabry, and we're here in his workshop today. Now Colin helped me out with fuel for the uh, Titan engine, and also the Taipan engine. And I just asked him to get out some engines that he would find interesting, or that you might find interesting. So what's, uh, what's your oldest engine, Colin? Would be the Olsen here, which is uh, mid-30s. Right. Uh, it would have been used to fly the uh, duration models of the day, probably around about six and a half cc. And where did you get this one? This came to me from an old fellow in from Toowoomba. Okay. Who uh, who sold it to me? So that's where that came from. And probably my favourite engine is the David Owen replica of the uh, Burford two and a half cc plane bearing 1958 diesel which is this little fella here did you restore this one or no that, that's brand new that's how oh, it's never right no no um he got his advertising done in western australia for this okay uh, boxes come from england cool and, and he he redone about 200 of these mm. uh, to, to fit in with the burford event in the australian nationals and you've been like uh, flying model aircraft all your life is yeah that right? 60 odd years i've been at this game yeah and you obviously love it yes <laughs> always <laughs> but uh, yeah no i just like to keep it alive you know people talk to me about all this stuff i collect but then again i send a lot of stuff to modelers all around the world who, who advertise on flying sites you're looking for a con or to look for a specific part of a motor and most times i'll have it here somewhere okay and i send a lot of stuff to people to help rebuild motors and all that sort of stuff well Thank you so much for showing us around and thanks for the help you've given me too. I really appreciate it. Welcome. This is just one small corner of Colin's workshop and these are all model aircraft engines. And down here, these are all plans for model aircraft. So if you're into model aircraft, it's an absolute treasure trove. This is the book that uh, I borrowed from Colin Mabry uh, when I was doing the rebuild on the Taipan Tyro engine. And this documents the entire history of engines built by Gordon Burford. Now Gordon uh, made his first engine back in 1946. Uh, I believe that the first one was this one here, the GB1, closely followed by the GB2. And these were basically built in his backyard, in his uh, garage. And uh, some of the very early production engines were made in batches of 100, and he and a friend assembled these on the kitchen table. But the, uh, the range of engines that he produced over, year, over the years was pretty astounding, really. Uh, their aim was to release a new engine every couple of years, and they borrowed very heavily on current trends in model aircraft engine production, uh, and they adapted and uh, remodeled those engines into what they thought were engines that would suit aero modelers in Australia. 
and this is the one that uh, we're working on this is the Taipan Tyro and uh, it's got some interesting data there about the engine this is the connecting rod and yes it is stamped <laughs> this photograph shows that very clearly there's some performance data here I'm hoping to use this when we test the engine to see if we're getting the same RPM for the same size prop this is the other engine that I bought this is the Taipan uh, 3.5cc glow plug engine and uh, I had the non-carburetor version because we used to fly this on control line aircraft and at the time this was a bit of an innovation this is a silencer it's got a flow through port in the center which uh, allegedly increased the performance slightly and there was a uh, bleed off here for pressure to pressurize the fuel tank but that was an excellent engine uh, I've had hours and hours of fun playing with that so there it is there's a book now I'll put the ISBN number in the description of the video below I know it's a bit of a niche area uh, but if somebody has purchased an old Taipan engine or if you're thinking about it this would be an excellent resource to identify the engine and some other information about its build one of the reasons I went to see Colin originally was to get the fuel for the engine. Uh, Colin has donated this fuel. Uh, the diesel engine fuel that I've got here is a mixture of ether, kerosene and castor oil. Now the castor oil and the kerosene is easy to get. The ether not so easy, although you can buy it. I checked there was an online store close to where I live, but you had to buy five litres at a time and they won't send it through the mail. So. This uh, little bottle here is more than enough. That's about half full. That's going to be plenty for what we're doing. Now, Colin also supplied these three propellers. Now, this white nylon propeller here is the original Taipan Tyro propeller that was supplied with the engine back in the day. In fact, all three of these propellers say Taipan Australia in the hub, but it's the white one that was supplied with the engine. Now, this little fuel tank here, this was sold by a company called Aeroflight. These are made of tin plate, which is just a very thin sheet of steel with a tin coating on the outside. Uh, it's very easy to cut and form and solder. In fact, I used to make my own tanks uh, with scraps of tin plate that I got from my metal workshop teacher at school. So that little tank there is big enough for the job. The other thing we're going to do uh, later, not in this episode, but in the next episode, we're going to work on this uh, cylinder cooling fin assembly. This is not really the cylinder head, it's just like a jacket that screws onto the cylinder liner to dissipate heat. This one's going to be a real challenge because it's quite heavily oxidized and there's a dent right on that sharp corner there. So I don't want to machine a lot off this. We're going to try and form that metal back to where it came from and just very, very lightly skim it or sand it to get rid of the oxide. But getting inside the fins there is going to be a bit of a challenge. So once you get all that cleaned up, we're going to do the anodizing and then we're going to reassemble the engine and we're going to test it. Okay, that's the end of today's episode. I invite you to come back next time and see the engine run and I, I'm sure it will run. There's nothing broken or damaged and there's plenty of compression in that engine so I'm absolutely certain it will run. And then after that, we're not doing model engines anymore. <laughs> I've got another project. Uh, I've got all the parts up here actually and they've been sitting there for about the last eight months waiting for me to get around to doing it but it's absolutely nothing to do with model engines but i'm sure you'll find it interesting nonetheless so that's sort of where we're headed uh, model engine project next uh, then the mystery project and i've got a couple of how-to videos that i want to show you but for now thanks for watching and uh, see you on the next episode it's presso out cheers